Cyberstein is gone. McDonald's had their last hurrah, and 2007 Yu-Gi-Oh! is here. Coming off the first emergency ban list, Yu-Gi-Oh! could steer in safer waters moving forward. So anyways, in January, Konami released Victory Dragon to the public via Shonen Jump promo. Previously the first place prize card in the 2003 World Championships, you now could get your Dorito Crusted Nubs on a monster that when it reduces your opponent's life points to zero, you win the match. No, not the game, the whole match. Yikes. Thankfully, between the monster's tough summoning conditions plus the fact that your opponent can just surrender the game before the attack goes through, made victory not so. Since you all like the OCG, I have to mention that in that region, conceding a game is more of a request. No, not in the way that they are not allowed to just scoop, rather a sign of duelist respect. That is, unless the duelist has a dark personality that is trying to take over their body to enact revenge against an Egyptian pharaoh. Also, if someone managed to pull off Victory Dragon on me, I'd be too impressed to quit. It would be a couple months before the list arrives, as early 2007 Yu-Gi-Oh! was kind of its own beast. The first major release would be January 17th with structure deck Machine Revolt, a deck focusing on the GX archetype Ancient Gears. The deck includes reprints of cards that would help define the upcoming format like Machine Duplication and Pot of Avarice. More notably, the deck introduced the TCG to the gadget monsters, specifically of the green, red, and yellow variety, in an order that would surprise you. These three mean bean machines were fantastic card advantage generators because each one, once summoned, could add another color to your hand. If you're ever curious on which one searches what, just look at the color of gear in the background art. It created a machine deck that had no issues trading one for ones. In fact, at the first SJC of the year in Orlando, Paul Lin would get first with what he calls Rusty Bucket of Bolts, a deck filled with a variety of machines from Ancient Gears, Gadgets, Cyber Dragons, a Roid, and even some Roulette Dragons for good measure, although it would be using Overload Fusion and Feature Fusion to create Chimera Tech Overdragon that was the real game-winning card. Yeah, this guy had Roids. Later on in the upcoming format, we would see gadget representation in the Canadian Nationals with first place Dexter Dali with a more anti-meta build and a more fun variation at SJC Houston by Paul Levitin in his Ratty Gadgets deck, a mixture of Rat Box and Gadgets. Gadgets certainly had hype coming into 2007, and despite them not seeing as major success one would had imagined, Duelists continued to make this rogue strategy work. Going back to Orlando for a minute, this was the start of the new Shonen Jump Championship season with a new prize card. Last year showcased the admirable Shrink, a simple spell that worked for its time. Now we have a card that blows Shrink out of the water, and that's none other than Crush Card Virus. Yep, Kaiba's infamous destruction trap is now in the TCG and is just as powerful as in the anime. Akin to the power of the recently banned SJC prize card Cyberstein, Virus could win games all on its own as its original effect destroyed your opponent's strong monsters. Remember, this isn't the graveyard field decks of future formats. Using this card on, say, a Sangan to let you know your opponent's hand, field, and draws for three turns was both knowledge and power. To say it was too strong for its own good is an understatement as it would receive an errata in 2015. Considering how tough it was to obtain and that it wouldn't get a wide release until 2008, nowadays duelists playing the upcoming Troop Dupe format would not play Crush Card Virus. February arrives with Champion Pack Game 2. These packs were the successor to tournament packs, with the second being notable for having Magical Stone Excavation. This was a spell that recovered a spell from your grave. Sure, the cost was a bit high, but considering it could get you the game-winning spell like Heavy Storm or Dimension Fusion, well, the card worked for its merit. One day later, on Feb 7th, was another side set being Duelist Pack Jade and Yuki 2. I skipped 2006's Chaz Pack, which included Armed Dragon Level 10, for it was Jaden's pack that included a card that helped define the coming format, Card Trooper. 
This card's effect was you could send the top 3 cards from the top of your deck to the grave to increase its attack for 500 for each until the end phase. If Trooper is destroyed, you get a draw a card. Trooper's main function was fueling the graveyard which in turn made a variety of cards active more than ever before. Pot of Avarice, Treeborn Frog, Bazoo the Soul Eater, the upcoming Destiny Hero Malicious, etc. And hey, it worked with machine duplication too, so you could get a fast pace engine going. The first deck we would see from this receiving a top spot would be at the next SJC at St. Louis with Jeff Baumgartner's top 4 deck, Novo Ratbox, a modernized earth-based toolbox deck, a splash of warriors, a little bit bazoo, and an early showcase of car troopers' might. SJC St. Louis would also be known for something else extremely unique to that event and that event alone. See, on April 21st, Shonen Jump Volume 5, Issue 4 hit newsstands with a new promo card, Elemental Hero, Stratos, a powerful e-hero and destiny hero searcher that could also potentially destroy back row cards too. At 1800 attack, Stratos was the steroid boost the hero archetype needed and was quite revolutionary for its searching capabilities. He set the standard for archetypes for the future of Yu-Gi-Oh! So why am I talking about it now? Shonen Jump magazines typically arrived a month before its official publication month, and it just so happened that some stores received them even earlier on February 19th. Since this was pre ban list, Stratos was free to reign until a new list could limit the card's acknowledged power. And what was that one event pre-list? SJC St. Louis, of course. Yes, it was about one week and one event where a dozen duelists had access to Stratos and no one else did. They never stood a chance. The deck sculpted from this would be known as Diamond Dude Turbo, DDT for short, or otherwise known in this specific incarnation, Air Blade Turbo. It should have been called Mental Heroes. First place would be piloted by Carlos Perez. This strategy is to abuse cards like Destiny Hero Diamond Dude, Dark Magician of Chaos, and a variety of powerful spells to constantly use and recur and go through your deck at a breakneck pace. Diamond Dude could mill a card, and if it was a normal spell, you could use it from your graveyard on the following turn. It didn't help that Dimension Fusion was still at 3 as well, because if you milled Fusion off Diamond Dude, then you didn't have to pay that 2000 life point cost. And this applied to other spells with a cost, like Lightning Vortex and Magical Stone Excavation, since the spell would be activating from the grave. Divine Sword Phoenix Blade would then banish your warriors only for you to get them back and continue the strategy from there with Dark Magician of Chaos to get cards back like Graceful Charity, Heavy Storm, or anything else you needed. It was a consistent deck that moved fast with resources, field wipes, and recursion, one of Yu-Gi-Oh's most unique short periods. At the end of the month, we would see the first core set of the year, Strike of Neos. This was the first core set to include secret rares since Soul of the Duelists left them out. Yeah, it's kind of weird to think that since that set, the higher rarities were ultimate rares and secrets took a backseat for almost three years. Neos introduced both the attribute reptiles and the six samurai to the TCG. Plus, there were support for heroes, Neospatians, Dark World, and Fairies. Gene Warped Warwolf was a cool card for being the first normal 2k attacker. Take that, Gemini Elf. Big cards would include Advanced Ritual Art, Dark World Dealings, DD Crow, Neospatian Grand Mole, and Pulling the Rug. There are a plethora of other solid cards, rounding off Strike of Neos as a great addition to the TCG, as we'll cover some of the impact cards as we go along. And just like that, on the 1st of March would be a new list, which would continue through the spring and summer of 2007. The goal of the list was to create diversity to the game, considering how Stein Monarch turned out in its last few events. Rightfully so, powerful cards were added to the list. Key forbidden cards would be Victory Dragon, Graceful Charity, and Last Will due to strong synergy with gadgets, adding to the reasoning behind the already limited ultimate offering. Key limited cards would be Chain Strike, thank fucking god, Dimension Fusion, Crush Card Virus, Snatch Seal coming off Forbidden Status, and Stratos, whom technically was added prematurely considering his official release. Metamorphosis was set to 2, and Exiled Force was set to 3. 
The nice thing about this list is that it forced the format to adopt a variety of attributes to take form in the meta instead of light and dark based decks. With less busted cards, you had more balanced tech like Smashing Ground and Enemy Controller. This list would go on to create the Troop Dupe format, otherwise known as Trooper format as named for the showing of card trooper in most meta decks. I don't know whether it's spelled D-U-P or D-U-P-E, both spellings seem to be right but I digress. The full name comes from the combination of car trooper and machine duplication in the saying troop doop scoop whoop de -de poop whoop scoop. That combo was pure deck thinning, gray fueling, card advantage, and OTK potential. Mwah. Even after Cyberstein, the OTK strategy could never stay down for the count it seems. The difference here is that despite a few OTK decks existing, it wasn't pulled off as often even if the format itself would shape up to be fast paced when compared to GOAT format. Two days later would be the first event at SJC Houston in which the format will start to form. Jonathan Moore would give Six Samurai a go. While not topping, Moore would eventually grab first place with Six Sams in the following year's SJC Houston. Chris Perovic would get second with Diamond Dude Turbo, showing that the deck still works post Airblade. His use of Magical Stone Excavation would be a key function to the deck for this iteration of the Reasoning Gate deck. First place for the 2007 event would be Iman Ganian with a funny named deck, Bazooper Return. It's Bazoo Return mixed with Car Trooper. Bazooper sounds like a Mario enemy, doesn't it? This would be the first big deck of the format, combining the efforts of Bazoo and Chimera Tech. Snipe Hunter could fuel the grave and was a replacement for Breaker. Smashing Ground helped clear the field. Future Fusion acted like a new age painful choice to help Bazoo, and Skull Lair would act as additional Bazoos. You can see where the strategy lies and why Ganian was able to pilot this to first place. But this was still very early in the format's lifespan. The deck would lose steam as the format progressed, as duelists learned to incorporate better cards once they got a grasp on the meta. You could say they firmly grasped it. On the 14th would be Strike of Neos, special edition that included the previous SJC prize card, Shrink. At this point, Shrink would still be considered a useful, balanced card. When it comes to the video game promo cards, Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship 2007 came out with the key card being Destiny Hero Disc Commander, a pot of greed monster when special summoned from the graveyard. This simple effect would be very useful as it could be sent to the grave easily with Car Trooper or Snipe Hunter and brought back with Call of the Haunted or Premature Burial. On the 17th of April, the third installment in the Duelist Pack was released, this time focused around the Destiny Hero Duelist himself, Aster Phoenix. The two big cards here would be, of course, of cards of Aster's own deck. Destiny Hero Malicious and Destiny Draw. Malicious, while in the graveyard, could banish itself to special summon another copy of itself from the deck. This would be a great way to summon another monster straight from the deck to the field, even if its stats were weak. And a great way to dump Malicious would be Destiny Draw, a draw too at the discard cost of a Destiny Hero card. So say you discard Malicious or the previously mentioned Disc Commander, now you have two monsters in the graveyard with powerful graveyard effects. And yes, Malicious made Car Trooper even better than before. These two cards were just what D-Heroes, and for that matter the meta, needed. This would culminate in the following SJC in Anaheim on the 28th with a couple notable decks. Theorisak Poonslambat would get top 8 with his Destiny Hero deck, or as it would be known as given the duelist nickname Big T, T-Hero. This is essentially Malicious Toolbox that was a unique build because of Metamorphosis. Even if Thousand Eyes Restrict was ironically restricted, the use of meta on cards like Cyber Dragon and Malicious could still get you out powerful fusion monsters like Dark Balter, Ryu Senshi, Reaper on the Nightmare, and Cyber Twin Dragon. Combine that with the great draw engine I've discussed and you've got yourself a dangerous deck. Oh, and yes, that is Crush Card Virus in the main. Big T had one and worked great with Malicious, which was clearly strong AF. 
Chris Bowling would get second place with Diamond Dew Turbo, with the creator no less. However, it would be first place Michael Songlok with another scary deck in Demise OTK. Out of the OTK decks during this time, it was the Ritual Monster variant that would become top tier thanks to Advanced Ritual Arts, which allowed you to send normal monsters from the deck to Ritual Summon. Now the bar for needing materials went down considerably to the point of meta viability. At SJC Columbus at the end of March, there would be a Demise Aggro Earth deck, and yet it was Songlok's build that proved to be the real deal. For those who don't know, by paying 2k life points, Demise could destroy all other cars on the field. Very Chaos-like. You could send strong normal monsters like Metal Armored Bug for Demise, and by filling the grave with lower level insects, you could also summon Doomdozer by banishing said insects. Any hand with Demise, a powerful spell like Metamorphosis, Premature Burial, or Megamorph, plus Doomdozer was enough for an OTK combo. While the combos themselves were linear, they were consistent, and that's what was important. Duelists soon realized this, and hand control cards like Mind Crush and Trap Dust Shoot rose in popularity, and thus Demise OTK wouldn't see as consistent tops, ironic enough. Force of the Breaker on May 16th would be the final core set for Troop Dupe format. This set is the introduction to both Volcanic and Crystal Beast archetypes. Yeah, for as famous as Crystal Beasts are to the GX era, it took quite a while for these cards to finally hit the TCG scene. These cards are unique for when the monsters are destroyed, they are sent to the back row instead, and can be used in a multitude of ways depending on the support card. Mark Glass would try and make the deck usable in the US Nationals to no avail. Breaker would also introduce Sky Scourge, which was supposed to be the new chaos mechanic revolving around light fairies and dark fiends, however the sum of its parts were garbage for it asked for too much. The last of the fun new groups was the Field Searchers. These are monsters you could discard from your hand to search a field spell straight from your deck like a monster version of terraforming. We would see quite a variety of cards for this, Archfiend General for Pandemonium, Gravekeeper's Commandant for Necro Valley, Harpy's Queen for Harpy's Hunting Ground, etc. It was a perfectly acceptable new addition to the game. What Force of the Breaker was really known for was two specific cards. The first is Eradicator Epidemic Virus. By tributing a strong dark monster, you can call spell or trap cards, and for three turns, it destroys that type of cards on your opponent's field, hand, and all cards they draw up till that third turn. While not as powerful, Powerful as his crush card brother, it still is solid nonetheless. The second card is a new monarch. It's Ryza, the Storm Monarch. Upon a tribute summon, Ryza would let you return one card on the field back to the top of the owner's deck. It avoided destruction and gave you info on what your opponent was going to draw for the next turn, and for them, there's a good chance it may become a dead draw. Ryza would become the main monarch in quick time because its effect made it so versatile for its effect could not just pick off monsters, but back row cards too. Other monarchs still weren't bad by comparison, for example, Zaborg still being useful as an almost fourth copy of Ryza, just solely for monster destruction. Yes, monarchs would still see plenty of play in this format since tributing a cyber dragon for a monarch was still a stable strategy. Plus, adding a new strong monarch saw the rise of brain control. Force of the Breaker would be a worthy final core set of troop dupe format. During May would be SJC Philadelphia with first place Jesse Samick breaking out perfect circle monarchs. The deck would be named for its combination of both monarchs and destiny heroes, two big decks at the time. Perfect Circle would get its real time in the sun in the following format. Another big deck from this event was Jeff Jones' Top 16 Big City deck. See, Strike of Neos introduced a field spell called Skyscraper 2 Hero City that would revive an elemental hero that was destroyed by battle. Also in May was the June Shonen Jump promotional card Elemental Hero Ocean, which would return one E-hero or D-hero from your field or grave back to your hand. 
By using recursion cards like Skyscraper 2 and Ocean plus protection cards, you could see Stratos multiple times to get you maximum card advantage. Then using cards like Wild Heart to avoid traps and Snipe Hunter to clear the field, you had great built-in monster protection. This is before mentioning the plethora of back row cards like Triple Solemn Judgment, Lightning Vortex, Trap Dust Shoot, and Pulling the Rug. Rug was a new trap from Strike of Neos, typically seen in more side decks that negated effects of freshly normal summoned monsters, so like Stratos, Monarchs, Manju, etc. Big City wouldn't be as big as the big decks, but a fun rogue deck that's worth mentioning. Come June 1st, we would see a mid-format limited list with only two specific cards, Magical Stone Excavation and Green Baboon, Defender of the Forest. Excavation was limited for it was a powerful card for the DDT deck that was released post-March ban list. It was a minor update to keep the meta healthy. Green Baboon may not sound familiar if you've been keeping up with the history series, and that's because it was a card that wasn't even released yet. Baboon was the Shonen Jump July subscription bonus along with Dread Scythe Harvester. With Baboon, he can be special summoned by paying 1000 life points when a B-Sight monster you control is destroyed. Upon knowing of this card's eminent release, Duelist quickly found an OTK to apply. With using Death's Counterblow all the way back from Ancient Sanctuary, yeah I remember that set, you could continuously loop two Baboons to completely assault your opponent's life points directly. This mid list was never published on Upper Deck's website, rather it was announced via a slip and jump subscription service, oddly enough. Afterwards were the US, UK, and Canadian Nationals. Canada would be known for Matt Peddle's Top 8 Machine Beatdown. The format was filled with great machines already, Car Trooper, Cyber Dragon, Jinzo, Dekoichi, but it was this deck that pulled them all together with the addition of Cyber Phoenix. Phoenix had been around for a while now, and yet this was its time in the limelight. It countered many Monarch engines for it could not be targeted by back row cards like Brain Control, Soul Exchange, and Snatch Steel, and when it is destroyed, you draw one card. In essence, machines were the anti-meta deck of the format that combined control with OTK potential depending on the duelist build. Trap Dust Shoot would also see more play because it countered decks like Monarchs, DDT, and Demise OTK. Philly Luna at SJC Phoenix in July would make it to top 8 as well with a heavier OTK variant using the Cyber Fusions compared to Pedal's beatdown style. The UK Nationals would be unique for having more representation from Horse the Black Flame Dragon, primarily level 6 in both top 8 and first place side decks. At the US Nationals, we saw a plethora of interesting decks. Vincent Tundo DD Monarchs, Justin Tomac Top 8 Aggro Bomb which had Dark World representation, Brian Rockenbach 2nd with 13 Gage Monarchs which is a deck all about Monarchs, 13 actually, and getting into that sweet Treeborn Frog, and 1st place with Adam Korn's Trooper Monarchs. This deck in particular would set the standard of the format. The use of engines, literally in Dekoichi's case, to get Monarchs out to control your opponent, whether it was on the field or in the hand, was key for the deck to work as well as it did. You saw the staples here. Treeborn Frog, Cyber Dragon, Ryza, Car Trooper, and of course, the monster control cards. Even though Metamorphosis isn't in the deck, Scapegoat was used to protect itself against OTK decks. Protect ya deck. It would solidify Trap Dust Shoot as a staple card moving forward, a card that has been around for a while in side decks and warrior decks, but now sees mainstream popularity. Trooper Monarchs gave the already established Monarch deck more card advantage field presence, and better ways to keep pressure. The US Nationals was the prime time for Troop Dupe format given its variety of meta viable decks. July 25th would be the return of the starter decks. Yeah, it's been since 2004 with Yugi and Kaiba Evolution. It's Jaden and Cyrus of GX fame. Unfortunately, the only new cards would be Cybertech Alligator and Expressroid. Yeah, 
From the 28th to 29th, however, would be the World Championship in San Diego. Familiar duelist Adam Korn from the USA would nab the bronze with Burn. Mattia Sarpa from Italy with the silver using machines, and Andre Toro from Chile claiming the metaphorical gold with what else but trooper monarchs. Burn would be an interesting deck as chain burn decks were killed off since the March list, yet Burn still had a place in the meta, evidently. Sarpa's machines wouldn't be the Fusion OTK variant, yet was still scary due to all the great card generators like Car Trooper, Cyber Phoenix, and Hydro Gedon. And Toro had the safe bet with the most solid deck helming Ryza and Thestalos as his main monarchs to ensure he knew what the opponent had in hand and then rip those cards out. Another great showcase of Trooper Monarchs. The prize cards would be Get Your Game On, a continuous spell that doubled the attack of E Hero and Neo Space Monsters, but only if you attend the championship. The other two were Chimera, the Master of Beasts, and Emperor of Lightning. Two match-winning monsters typed around beasts and thunder monsters respectively. Doesn't Emperor of Lightning just look like Zaborg? Perhaps it was the inspiration for the later released Mega Monarch sub-archetype. August would be the final month for Troop Dupe format. Midway through the month, the next set, Tactical Evolution, would be released. However, it was not legal until the following month post ban list. So we'll talk about that set in the following video. The 18th would be the final event for the format at SJC Indianapolis, where Kenny So defeated his contemporaries with a surprise burn deck. Is a heavier trap variant when compared to Adam Korn's third place deck at Worlds. Clearly, burn decks are the deck that will never die. It makes sense given Car Trooper could attack under Gravity Bind and Level Limit Area B. Then you just use a metric ton of protection and burn and bam, the fire rises again. No one was prepared for Kenny So's deck. This would also be the first event with the new prize card, Gold Sarcophagus, a spell that would lead into the following format. When the next month hit, so did a new ban list, which marked the new era of competitive play and thus ending Troop Dupe format. Troop Dupe, Trooper, whatever you want to call this spring-summer 2007 format, it was a great time for the metagame. There were tons of diverse, viable decks, Trooper Monarchs, T-Hero, Machines, Beatdown or OTK, DDT, Demise OTK, Perfect Circle Monarchs, Bazooper, Gadgets, Burn, Big City, and even good stuff was still around. He also had fun decks show up like Cyber Dark with Five-Headed Dragon, Warrior Toolbox from the European Championship, Chris Mooseman Anti-Meta Heroes, Final Countdown, Jeff Jones Beasts, and many more. So both top decks and rogue decks made their rounds, some earlier in the format and some later, but Duelist testing new strategies the entire way. We saw powerful new cards like Stratos, Car Trooper, and Ryza, along with the rise of previously existing cards like Cyber Phoenix, Brain Control, and Trap Dust Shoot. Even the Cytec game was relevant with Banisher of the Radiance, DD Crow, Jinzo, and Pulling the Rug. It was a format better suited for lingering power cards in the Monarchs, and unlike its 2006 version, it was less one-for-ones and more emphasis on field advantage. The 2006 meta was mostly an echo of GOAT format, while 2007 felt like a true fresh dueling scene. In many ways, it felt like what Upper Deck wanted Stein Monarch format to be, given the Monarch-centric meta just now with a healthy dose of burn and OTK. Trooper would last a fair chunk of time, yet now we've reached the end, and what comes next will bring the game full circle.